I need to say a word or two in light of the fact that there is what we will talk about, an industrial strength campaign to censor this story. And I need to say something rather directly to those who are most likely to attempt to censor it. What I want to say is that Dr. Corey is not only an advocate for a therapy that is incredibly useful in the context of COVID-19, but he is also someone who has pioneered therapies already that are now the standard of care for COVID-19 patients. That means he has earned the right to talk about whatever he thinks is important. For my part, as you know, I was also very early on the lab leak hypothesis, and I was very careful about how I presented it. And of course, in the last month, that hypothesis has been vindicated. Everyone, including Dr. Ralph Barrick, who is the leading expert in the world on bat-borne coronaviruses and their modification in the lab, has acknowledged that a leak from the lab in Wuhan, China, is plausible. I have also earned the right to talk about what I want to talk about and what I think is necessary. We are now going to have a conversation, and if you don't like it, that YouTube is your problem. We are entitled to discuss this because a lot depends on it. And what we do when issues are complex <clears throat> is we hash them out and figure out what's true through dialectic. So that's what we're going to do. I do want to talk to you a little bit about what it looked like as you, as a lung specialist, an ICU specialist, were encountering COVID patients and coming to understand what they were really sick with. Rather, I mean, I remember the early days of the pandemic and the sort of groping for reason. Why do the symptoms look like this, right? Is it a lung disease? Is it a blood disease? What is it? So what did happen with these patients? What did you realize about them? Yeah. So <clears throat> sorry about um, uh, clearing my throat, but you know, it was clearly, you know, what was clearly recognized early on is that it was a disease of phases, right? So it started out as a general viral syndrome. Most people recovered, self-limited, and it's like a cold, right? Sometimes a little, a little bit more severe than a cold. But everyone quickly realized that around day five, seven, eight, there was a proportion of patients who suddenly started dropping their oxygen levels. And basically, their lungs were inflamed. And we now know that it's a cell called a macrophage, which gets activated and literally attacks the lungs. And so you have this sort of immune response that is attacking the lungs, and the lungs start to fail. They so start, yeah. a macrophage is like an amoeba-like cell that yep. goes around basically garbage collecting. Yes. It does a little scavenger, more than that. Yeah, it's yeah. a scavenger cell. So yeah, it yeah. was attacking it's like the, the lung front tissue. Line, it's the front line of defense, right? Yeah. And so so, yeah, and it, and it goes into the lungs and it causes a lot of inflammation. And so that inflammation injures the lung. And so you could see the lungs not starting not to work. And so it's predominantly a severe lung disease. And, and what I will never forget in my life is those early months because – and I'm going to go back to that steroid thing. We saw patients, just this disease marching straight to the ventilator. And so many people were landing on ventilators. And you remember, people were running out of ventilators. And there was two reasons for that. One is because the entire healthcare community globally said this is a viral disease, so supportive care only. You're talking about Tylenol and fluids. And as they did supportive care only, because there was no randomized controlled trials letting them know to do, like everyone talks about evidence-based. I'm always like, what about experience-based medicine? Like, I've been doing this for 30 years. Why can't I do what my experience tells me to do? I don't have randomized controlled trials, but to do nothing was leading to ventilator shortages. Okay. I, I want to clear one thing up for my audience who won't be familiar with the, the terminology and then make a point uh, about Please. what you've just said. The first thing is, uh, what did you call this uh, policy of uh, uh, Tylenol and- Supportive, supportive care, only. care only. So the idea here is that historically speaking, we have had very little to do about viruses. Yes. We've been tremendously effective with uh, antibiotics against bacteria, against fungi. They don't, in general, work against viruses. And antiviral therapies have been a dicey business for Absolutely. a long time. What does work has been vaccines. <clears throat> Um, but if you get to a pandemic and you don't have a vaccine, what you were effectively being told is, look, there's not a whole lot of positive intervention you can do. So let's just make them comfortable, rescue them if they need to be rescued. But other than that, kind of hands off. 
But here's the here's here's one of the mistakes. So it is correct to say we don't have good antiviral therapies. It's incorrect to say that they were dying of the virus. We knew relatively early on. By the time they get to the ICU and they're that sick, there's not a lot of viral replication going on. In fact, you can't culture virus after about day seven or eight. And so it's actually disease of inflammation, not viral invasion. In fact, in autopsy series, only 20% do they find what's called cytopathic changes from the virus into the lung. And so <clears throat> it wasn't you didn't have to go after the virus at that point. You had to actually check the inflammation. Okay. So again, I want to do a little translation for the audience. So inflammation, and by the way, this is a place where I would take doctors to task, but right. doctors often treat something like information as if it's inflammation, as if it's simply bad. The fact is inflammation is an adaptation yes. that often gets out of control and Absolutely. it can easily kill you, right? Over exuberant. And right. So we have so, to bring it into check. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. what you're telling me is that COVID patients were infected with the virus. It triggered a pathway that is part of healing, but triggered an overreaction. And the patients Absolutely. who were dying on these ventilators weren't really dying of the virus being so very active. They were dying of this cascade of events that follows the body's attempt to fight off a pathogen it's never seen. It was a reaction to the, in fact, one of the most impressive studies um, that uh, Paul actually highlighted is that they what we think triggers the inflammation is actually the viral debris. It's the RNA that actually has this, it triggers this massive response to the body. So it's not the virus, it's actually the debris of the dead virus that does it. So it's- Well, let me uh, flag something for the future. Um, my advisor, who's now gone, a guy named Dick Alexander, used to talk um, about the point in a uh, in a a respiratory illness when you stop coughing <clears throat> on behalf of your virus and start coughing on your own behalf. And the point mm -hmm. he was making was that actually the these pathogens necessarily induce changes that cause them to be passed on. So they will yeah. create irritation, they will create right. inflammation, they will create all kinds of phenomena that are symptoms that are actually basically the the ecology that allows them to thrive. To transmit. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so in a sense I don't know why it's the viral debris, but there's a pretty good chance that this virus learned that by creating debris, it could cause a lot of stuff to accumulate in the lungs that got ejected in some chaotic way. Who knows? It could be. Yeah. So I didn't think of it that way. Yeah. It, it's, it's worth thinking about. <laughs> but the other point I, I wanted to make in reference uh, to your sense as a clinician that you were you know, effectively having your hands tied behind your back when you knew a whole lot about patients and were learning more every day, right? You needed to be freed to try things. And the point I would make is once upon a time, before we were born, Doctors were scientists. Yes. They had fewer tools, but what they had was a whole lot of experience. And even I, I want to bring attention to the house call, which has now effectively gone extinct. Yeah. But the house call allowed a doctor who didn't have a huge range of you know, pharm pharmacological agents or tools at his disposal. But what he did have was the ability to observe patterns, observe right? So patterns. if people yes. on one side of town were sick with something and people on the other side of town weren't, maybe there was something in the water, for example. So anyway, that ability to observe patterns was part of a scientific mindset that my impression, having interacted with doctors over my lifetime, is that that mindset has basically dwindled. You know, I love that you're going back because I love the history of medicine. And when I read stuff from 100 years ago, you're constantly shocked by how much they knew with very little of it. I mean, they don't have the experience, you know, the experiments or the, the techniques to discover what now we know. They did it all by powers of observation. Just and, the, and really, medicine was created by the best doctors who had the keenest powers. So the giants of medicine had these unbelievable powers of observation, and they were able to do a lot. And, and that's what I always say to my students. I always say that what separates sort of them from me, it's we've read the same books. We all have, you know, the, the textbooks. I said, but an expert has pattern recognition. You just see diseases play out. You see how different people react to same illnesses. And you just get to see patterns and patterns. And, and what happened to me, I love talking about this, but, you know, every time I came to the bedside of a patient and there was something wrong with them, I always had to very deliberately kind of analyze, like, could it be this or this or this? And after about a couple of years being immersed in ICU medicine, 
I noticed that I could now walk into a room and just like with very little information, just kind of know what was going on. It suddenly became like intuitive and second nature. And it was all just about observing patterns. And so I, I think that's really key. And and that's why with this disease, like I, I this is not an ego exercise, but we knew you had to anticoagulate these patients within like four patients. Like we knew they were clotting to degrees that we hadn't seen. And there was so much controversy around putting someone on a blood thinner, which people are put on blood thinners in hospitals for far less reasons than we were promoting with this. And so it was just evidence-based maniacism. It was bizarre. They, like now you can't observe, you can't make clinical reasoning, you can't deduce, you need a trial before you do anything. Okay. So this is, I must tell you, exactly the same thing <clears throat> in my field, right? The people who are really good uh, evolutionary biologists or ecologists, evolutionary yeah. ecologists in, in the best cases, um, have intuition. They know how to follow a hunch. They know how to figure out when their hunches are wrong. Yes. Right? The point is, it's a it's an art more than a science, actually. No question. And in the case of a brand new pandemic that is spreading like wildfire, this is, of course, exactly the mindset that you want. You want people who are capable of deducing that there is some pattern and then figuring out whether they were fooled by some sort of uh, noise pattern or whether it was actually something, testing a hypothesis. But there is a point at which you know, and you know better than a study because you you know you've acted on that hunch and you've seen that the patients get better and it happens enough times that it can't be random and so anyway there's something about the mindset of the moment in which it's all about peer review and these published peer reviewed papers and it's all about the official guidance from you know the who and the yep. cdc yep. and it's basically a kind of intellectual authoritarianism yes. that is so bizarre in the context of a complex system like medicine especially in the context of a brand new disease that you know we're all not experts in there are no experts that we can simply default to everybody's you know a novice it, i'd like that term intellectual authoritarianism because and it it actually although I don't know that it was occurring to this degree or even remotely to this degree pre-COVID. I, I actually, I looked around in COVID and I started to see like all the institutions coming up with their treatment protocols. You weren't allowed to stray from the protocol. Even like if you're an expert and you're like, I want to like, literally the leaders of the hospitals were saying, don't use, and you couldn't do anything else. You couldn't actually doctor. And suddenly I felt like I was being handcuffed. Well, it, it was bizarre. I I've never seen that in my life before. I have the sense that doctors have been demoted forcibly demoted from the position of scientific clinician to technician. And the yeah. point is you're really delivering a prepackaged good more than you are uh, coming to understand your patient and what they're sick yes. with and what they therefore need. And it's a travesty. I've never been asked to do that before. I've always been asked to use the, the best extent of my experience and judgment and insight to best help the patient. That's the oath I took. My, the oath wasn't do what the gods of science and we, Paul calls the, uh, the, the, the healthcare leaders, the gods of science and knowledge, right? Cause mm. this sort of, you know, we're just little mortals and we have to listen to the gods. And, and I've never been asked that before to, 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 to get advice from oftentimes, I'm sorry, but I don't want to sound so dismissive, but Many of them are really desk jockeys. I mean, they're not on the front lines. I mean, <clears throat> they're reading some papers. They think they know what the disease is. They don't know what this disease is. They're not sweating it out, seeing day-to-day -day the, the manifestations, the responses to therapy, the lack of responses. Like They don't understand this disease, and yet they're telling everyone how to treat it. And I find it – we want a seat at the table, expert clinicians. Where's the expert clinician committee? Right. Absolutely agree. And, you know, you see that at the level of doctoring. Yeah. I see that at the level of the pandemic itself. Yes. Right? The fact is, we have a novel phenomenon. It came potentially from an unusual source, yep. right? A knowable <clears throat> source, potentially. What we are supposed to do about it to actually um, take care of it so that it does not become a permanent fellow traveler of humanity, that takes really smart, insightful, courageous people who have been totally liberated to have whatever discussions yeah. need to be had. Instead, we're in this situation where if we open our mouths and say the wrong word, suddenly there are warnings appended to what we've said. It's, it's insane. It's, it's limiting discussion, limiting choices, limiting approaches. And, 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 and it's, it's hurt. Yes, it's... 
And I don't know, do we, did we all forget the history books that we read? Like, when has censorship ever been a good thing? Yeah, when, when are the censors <laughs> ever the good guys? Like, I mean, <laughs> when has that ever le- led to a societal good? Right. You know? Well, that, that is, I mean, and I, I, fr- I really hope that uh, whatever thing it is inside of YouTube and Twitter and Facebook yeah. and LinkedIn that has its meetings, I hope they look at this and they sit down and somebody in the room is courageous enough to look at everybody else and say, are we the bad guys in the story? And yeah. if so, how did that and happen? Brett, like, <clears throat> I get the intention, right? So you want to protect people because – Medical mis- misinformation might harm them. But what I find, I have, I have two problems with that, which is who's, who's going to, you know, if you're going to limit science, I mean, science, that's the antithetical to science. Science is about exploration, hypotheses. Yep. And science has never discovered at the NIH building, right? right? It's actually the people on the ground doing experiments, making deductions. We should flow the information to them, not they not flow the information to us. So, so that is that. And then the placing of medical misinformation on a par with like violent hate speech, white supremacy, like – I'm sorry, but medical, you know, it's medical participation, it it's not as harmful as you would think. I mean, you know, people are afraid that you're going to espouse some medicine that's not going to work and they're going to hurt someone. I, I think people do not need to be protected to that extent. I mean, people have judgment. They do lots of things in the world. You know what I'm saying? Like censorship's not the answer to that. 